A warm welcome to Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Feels good to be back. Here are the highlights of the program today. Nigeria's new president, Bola Tinubu, attends a Global Climate Summit in France, his first official trip abroad since his inauguration on May 29. Plus, U.S.-China tensions. Uh, president Biden calls Xi Jinping a dictator. A day after Beijing talks, China says President Biden's comment violates its country's diplomatic protocol and political dignity. That's all in a moment. First, a quick check on other discussions in diplomatic circles. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says the turmoil caused by the unexpected challenge to the authority of President Vladimir Putin by Wagner fighters could take weeks or months to play out and may not be over yet. During TV interviews after Yevgeny Prigozhin, head of the Wagner mercenary group, began to leave Rostov and Don, a major Russian military post they'd taken over. Blinken said tension that led to the aborted mutiny by the forces had been rising for months and that the turmoil could affect Moscow's capabilities in Ukraine. He said neither the United States nor the Russian nuclear posture had changed as a result of the crisis. Uh, this has been uh, a devastating strategic failure for Putin uh, across virtually every front, uh, economic, uh, military, uh, geopolitical standing. Uh, there is absolute unity, both of purpose and in action, in terms of supporting the Ukraine, making sure they have what they need to defend themselves. And that's where our focus is. That's where the president's focus has been. In the meantime, a new deal brokered under Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko will see Wagner mercenary chief Yevgeny Prigozhin move to Belarus to end the armed mutiny that Prigozhin has led against Russia's military leadership. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov told reporters on Saturday that President Lukashenko had offered to mediate with Russian President Vladimir Putin because he'd known Prigozhin personally for around 20 years. Peskov said the criminal case that had been opened against Prigozhin for armed mutiny will be dropped and that the Wagner fighters who had taken part in his March for Justice, as he called it, will not face any action in recognition of their previous service to Russia. Fighters who had not taken part will sign contracts with the Defense Ministry, which has been seeking to bring all autonomous volunteer forces under its control by July the 1st. Witnesses in the Sudanese capital Khartoum have reported more clashes, artillery fire and airstrikes as the fighting between rival military factions in the country entered its 11th week. They also reported a sharp increase in violence in recent days in Yala, the largest city in the western Darfur region. The UN raised the alarm on Saturday over ethnic targeting and the killing of people from the Masalit community in El Janina in West Darfur. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has signed a partnership agreement with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. During their talks, Modi and El Sisi discussed matters on education, renewable energy, and boosting trade and Indian investment in Egypt. Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu attended the Global Economic Summit in France focused on climate change. President Tinubu said Nigeria is ready for global business. He called on investors to take advantage of opportunities in the country assuring them that the ongoing economic reforms, which include the removal of fuel subsidy and streamlining of exchange rates, will be sustained for a more competitive economy that attracts foreign direct investment. President Tinubu made the comments in the sidelines of the summit for a new financing pact in Paris, where he also met with the president and chairman of the board of directors of African Export Import Bank, Professor Benedict Orama, as well as President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, Odile Renault Basso, among others. For climate action. These are leaders from across the world, welcomed by the host, French President Emmanuel Macron. They are meeting here in Paris, hoping to raise finance for a new pact, pinning down a roadmap for easing debt burden of low-income countries while freeing up more funds for climate change financing. Among them is Nigeria's president, Mr. Bola Tinubu, as well as the Egyptian president, 
the Ethiopian Prime Minister and key players such as the World Bank and the United Nations. Although binding decisions are not expected, officials of the summit say strong commitments should be made in financing poor countries. We speak for a complete transformation of securing the sources of capital, as unpopular as it might be to voice it. We do not ask for the bankruptcy of private companies. That's not our wish. But we do ask for everybody to share the burden so that we can share the bounty. You must make polluters pay. You must cancel the debt and get grant-based climate finance to Global South countries so that they are no longer forced to pay for a crisis they did not create. You must be thinking in trillions, not billions. You must help us get real loss and damage funds to flow to those communities who need it the most. And we must remember that more fossil fuels only means more loss and damage. We did arrive at a deal, the JetP deal with a number of countries, and we found this to be a pioneering uh, deal, quite historic, uh, in that uh, an amount of $8.5 billion was uh, committed to support our transition to uh, clean energy. His President Ramaphosa's comments reiterates the challenges African countries face with unprecedented financial squeeze, forcing them to manage debts instead of developments. It's private and public debt has reached new heights. Today in most low-income countries, the headaches of government is not to think about development, but to think about how we can manage debt. All our efforts to manage debt instead of focusing on development. As if dealing with all these crises were not difficult enough. We also faced devastating climate effect. It is President Bola Tinubu's first official trip since his inauguration on May 29. A special advisor to the president on special duties, communications and strategy, Mr. Dele Alake, says the president is in Paris to network and woo investors to the country. The sense of this meeting, why the president is attending, is to network extensively with developed societies, donor agencies, financial institutions, and foreign investors with a view to inviting and, and really encouraging direct foreign investor investment back into Nigeria. This summit has come and gone. A new global financial system is birthed, but it remains to be seen if vulnerable countries like Nigeria will be better equipped to combat both poverty and climate change. Let's discuss this now. Joining me is African Affairs Analyst Yinka Oyeniji. He joins me from London. Thank you for joining me on Diplomatic Channel, Mr. Oyeniji. Thank you also for having me. Nigeria's new president, uh, Mr. Bola Tinubu, was in Paris for the Global Financing Summit, his first international trip since he became president. Do you think he was well received by the international community? Oh, well, so, I mean, regardless of whether we are still in court or not challenging, I mean, the uh, results of those elections being challenged, Nigeria has a president, okay? We have a substantive president today who's been inaugurated, and it's President Bola Metinomu, and that means that he represents everything else that Nigeria has been over time, even before those elections are now, which is the fact that we have so many human resources, Nigeria is blessed with so many human resources who are representatives of the country everywhere including uh, with international uh, agencies and do not, uh, if you like, organizations. So, uh, I mean, President uh, Bola Metinibu was simply continuing from where the last government stopped. And uh, wherever the uh, president of the most populous black nation is, the attention is there. Uh, we have the people who've been representing us before now doing so uh, very well too. And so, yeah, he's riding on uh, that formidable platform that uh, uh, always been there. So he had no other choice but to represent us well. I think that, yes, the world is paying attention. 
Yeah, and just before you know, he went on this trip, um, he's been he had been present for about three weeks. So he'd made a handful of reforms uh, just days after the inauguration, uh, from removal of fuel subsidy, which Nigerians are still crying under, to the sacking of service chiefs and the detention of the central bank governor, Mr. Godwin Imifili. Nigeria is in numerous economic challenges as we speak. Was it important that he attend the summit? Do you think, especially? seeing how short a period of time it was from when, you know, he was sworn in as president. And, and do you think that, you know, what do you think it, this, this um, summit achieved for Nigeria? All right. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, in the build up to the election, we listened to many of the leading uh, presidential candidates, and I'll tell you the truth for free, uh, that Mr. Bola Ahmed Sinumbu at that time made huge promises, sensitive promises that, uh, endeared him to technocrats who are experienced home and abroad about what he was promising. And I can give you an example of what he said that I've never had any government official, whether prospective or substantive or any elected official or anybody seeking election say, even as presidential candidates. He said, why shouldn't we buy Nigeria's petroleum products in Naira? And immediately he said that I started to listen to him. That was outstanding. Mm -hmm. Regardless of whatever anybody feels about his personality, I mean, that was bold, okay? Because on the day that we have, we, we, we can squeeze that in. It's, it's almost revolutionary to say that Nigeria's petroleum products can be bought in Naira. That day, then we have, we have successfully unshackled, unmanacled the Naira. That's number one. Number two, he was also asked questions about climate change. And while you have the former vice president able to adduce facts to the fact that Nigeria may not necessarily dance to the wings of caprices of also international agencies, of governments that have benefited from fossil fuels before now, and well, rightly so, want to start to do right by embracing renewable energy. But I met Tinubu also said in the build up to the election that he needs to explore his own gas deposits before mm -hmm. anybody can start to talk to him about climate change. Now, I don't think that is irresponsible because the truth of the matter is if Nigeria is going to industrialize, then we may have to skew global agenda according to what benefits Nigerians. And then I'll say put Nigeria first. So he made these uh, uh, promises and I see that he's also following in up at this time. So yes, a lot of attention will be paid to Nigeria. He will make tough decisions. He's made a few of those. I don't even think that uh, the biggest of them would be maybe removal of subsidies, student loans, or otherwise. It's the plans he has. I read a couple of days ago that he said it was not included in his speech that he should say anything about subsidy, but that he got there and some spirit possessed him and he made that statement. Now. Whereas everybody agrees that subsidy should have been removed before now, and he attempts to be bold enough to make it, I think he was just merely uh, bragging. I think he was just bragging, right? There are some policies you brag about to test the landscape, and then after some reactions, you then have a balance, okay? Which is what I think yeah. he has done. So he understands governance, he understands when to be forceful, he understands when to make statements that will brag, so that when even he's going to fall, he's not going to fall very far from what he wanted, okay? Which is what I think he's doing. He's very bold to make those decisions, and we'll see uh, whether he's able to push them through, and how well those decisions will all go for the country. Yeah, and, and that's where the interest is, isn't it? Um, what Nigeria hopes to gain from a summit like this, uh, because even though, you know, the focus is on climate change, uh, people back home want to see, uh, the hope in this is not the president who will make policy statements outside. Clearly, he has started off by making those policy statements inside of Nigeria. But the two-day summit um, considered opportunities to restore fiscal space to countries that face difficult short-term financial challenges, especially in debtor countries like Nigeria. Do you see the summit restoring Nigeria's fiscal space? Oh, well, so what I see at the moment is, well, is like I said, it's bold enough to want to uh, do what you consider unthinkable before now. But it will, it will definitely uh, shape where we go. One thing that we must be careful of as Nigerians is the, is the fact that the president has got uh, many good people around him, maybe those who have been experienced and have uh, held sway in different political offices before now. 
But we should take note of these statements, take note of these promises that have been made, and then begin to engage with them. Because what I suspect is that we may get carried away with the politics behind making policies. And that's a different kettle of fish altogether. We don't yet know what happens at, at, the, at the tribunal. We can't. It's sub -judice. We can comment about them. We can't anticipate what happens. But what we must understand is there must be a Nigerian statement. What makes Nigeria work so that regardless of any occupier of any office at any point in time, we will seem to be having a developmental agenda. For that, policymakers, all stakeholders, and also politicians themselves must engage, not with the individual, but with the policies so that we see whether we it all goes well for us yet again, so that we don't find ourselves suffering from maybe amnesia or holding on to promises that were not actionable in the first place. So it definitely will change the political space. A number of uh, investments actually like leave the country because of unfavorable economic policies. What hopes are there that things could change under this new president? Um, he met with you know, about three or four heads of states uh, who had indicated interest to meet him at, um, at, at the summit on the sidelines. And they talked about areas of cooperation, economy, agriculture, and so on. There's so much um, investments that could be done here in Nigeria. What do you make of this, of this move? And you think it could help facilitate direct foreign investments in Nigeria? I'll tell you something, Amarachi. Uh, we'll only be playing our street hiding our heads in the sand if we seem to believe somehow that economic policies are to be held responsible for exodus of businesses in Nigeria. I don't think that is correct. I happen to know a case study of a, a tomato packaging uh, factory in the north. I believe it's in Kirby or near Kirby states. I don't know the figures, maybe $25 million investment today. They moved out of the country and then they are trying to find their feet again. It's almost out. The business is almost out. We need to fight insecurity. The resources that we need to develop our country is there in Nigeria. The funding that we require is there. But I've said something several and I'm going to say it again. There are at least two or three things that need to change about Nigeria. What we see, how passionate we are about it, and how we think about it. Those three things are really critical. Even if you drive trailer loads or airplane filled with currencies, which is happening actually in Nigeria, into Nigeria to give to the people or give to the government to advance any kind of economic development, it won't happen. Once the leaders are passionate enough not to consider their personal aggr aggrandizement or their, uh, the fact that they believe it's, it's somebody's, uh, it's my right at this time to be in government. Once we're sure of all of that, then we are ready for progress. How much foreign investment is in Ghana? Ghana is doing better nowadays. It took a president who said, you know what, I'm not having you export my raw materials anymore. You develop them here and then you can have finished goods. It's the same thing we have seen in Rwanda. We have seen it in Tanzania. It is happening in Uganda. Talking about uh, security challenges, of course, which affects everyone in Nigeria. I remember that when the previous administration uh, came into power, one of the things that people were looking at was for the body language. They said, you know, would sort of like help, you know, douse the whole insecurity vibe all over the country. But it's gotten worse over time. And this president is coming and he has changed security chiefs. What impact do you think that this would have? So uh, what, what do you think would change now? What, what I mean, because Nigerians have high expectations for this administration. Now, uh, the former chief security uh, advisor, to, in whatever capacity he was to uh, lead uh, Sonia Abacha, talked about the link between uh, mineral resources, smuggling going on, and insecurity. The only reason you have insecurity in any nation, in any African country, is because there's some, there's some smuggling going on. It's for economic gains, which is at variance with the popular uh, uh, well-being of the entire nation. For right. every part of Nigeria that you have insecurity today, there's some smuggling going on. Okay, from Mushogbo in Osho State, where you have gold, to Zafara, that you have gold. So Nasarawa, that can be the hub of our renewable energy, you just find pockets of kidnappings. They are taking over villages and are doing all sorts. This is to scare away investors. So it don't matter to us that we have changed service chiefs. I've said it time and again. Why should we have the military providing security for us internally? I can never understand that. 
there was a time we were exporting the very best of our military might in the days of economic peacekeeping. But right now, we've got police force, we've got civil defense, we've even got SSS. There was a point in this country where you don't see mobile policemen every day. You don't see those detachments on the street. Whenever you see a mobile police truck on the road, then it's inimical to any evil that is out there. Yeah. But what I'm saying at the moment is, until we start to be sincere, how much did the last administration budget to fight Boko Haram? I mean, it's sensible enough. Why should people want to kill themselves if life is worth living? So we've got to prevent crime rather than try to tackle crime We're alone. We've got soldiers, mm. we are losing boys, we are losing the best of our men to, sometimes you call it banditry. I, I don't see it other than uh, terrorism, is what it is. And then we've got people allegedly sponsoring Boko Haram. The case is not going anywhere in court. So if the president is going to do anything much more than also a uh, retaining service chief, what budget? Can we investigate the budget for fighting uh, uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria? How much arms have we bought? Who are those sponsoring them? Can we start to make these youth feel a sense of belonging? It's not enough to say we give students loan to go to school. So when they get out, they are even much more indebted in an unemployed, unemployment market, all right? So are we providing job opportunities? Are we training so them with the requisite skills to be able to do well for themselves so that they won't carry the burden of student loans for the rest of their life? So we have to start to look at proactive preemptive strategy, which is to engage populace to ensure that crime is not even worth going into, much more mm. than superfluous improvements of just appointing people. Let's investigate and be sincere with ourselves to ensure that we prevent crime rather than trying to control it. There's a lot of expectations on this administration as well as what we hope to see eventually. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Oyeniji. I know that we'll have plenty more to talk about in the course of the remaining weeks. Thank you again for joining me on Diplomatic Channel. Thank you also. It's nice to have you interview me. Uh, we are optimistic about the present administration and may the government succeed. Welcome back. The new British High Commissioner to Nigeria, Mr. Richard Montgomery, has clarified the issue of granting UK visas to Nigerians, stating that managing visitor numbers and migration to the United Kingdom is the way to go. UK envoy was speaking with correspondents at the presidential villa in Abuja, after a closed door meeting with Vice President Kashim Shatima at the State House in Abuja, he said deliberations at the meeting centered around trade collaborations between both countries, as well as measures that might be possible to cushion the effect of economic pressure on Nigerians. I would like to put uh, the media debate about this in wider context. So, last year, for example, the UK granted three million new visas of which 325,000 of those visas were to the UK, to, for between Nigeria and UK. So Nigeria, Nigerian uh, visitors constitute over 10% of the people coming to London and the UK. Uh, on the issue of student visas, I'd also just like to provide the context that the number of Nigerian students coming to the UK has increased fivefold in the last three years. It's a fantastic success story for our universities, and we're really delighted that so many Nigerians are coming to the UK. The issue about restrictions on people bringing dependents, uh, that's partly because not just from Nigeria, but from many parts of the world, many more students are trying to bring their dependents with them. And I think that there are two issues here. The first is, uh, it's, it's not always possible to find the housing and services to meet all the needs of all our existing student population. Uh, and secondly, I think reasonable people would accept that we have to manage our, our visitor numbers and that we have to manage migration in and out of the UK, just as the Nigerian government does for your own borders. U.S. President Joe Biden during the week called his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping a dictator and China a country with real economic difficulties. It came after a day after U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken met Mr. Xi for talks in Beijing aimed at easing tensions between the two superpowers. Mr. Biden's remarks have drawn condemnation from China, cracking open a new rift just after the two countries agreed to tentative steps to stabilize their relationship. 
By the North said she was embarrassed after an alleged Chinese spy balloon was shot down by the United States. A balloon which China says was monitoring weather drifted across the continental, the continental US that is, before being destroyed by an American military aircraft in February. That's Diplomatic Channel this week. You can watch this and other episodes again on youtube.com slash channels web and on the channel's television playlist. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you next time.